Good afternoon, accelerators. It is an awesome, awesome day here in Victoria, BC. The sun is out. September is in full swing. Kids are in school, and I hope we're all back to making some money after this long summer of fun and hopefully making some money throughout the summer. So I'll dive right into some questions. You know, add, add any comments after or during the live. I might not get to them now, but yeah, I love these questions. First one is from Ricardo. I always feel like I need a haircut whenever he asks a question. So I, I need to get, get out and see my local barber. His question is, how can I incentivize employees to stay longer with the company? I just took a look at one photo on our website of, an old, of and it was an old team photo. Everybody in that photo was gone. And you know, I know your question is about retention. You know, you've got a barber business and you want to keep your employees. So you're thinking about things like stock shares, bonuses. Um, what can you use to kind of keep them around to grow the business? Because, you know, you know, some guys can go off and start their own barber shop, operate out of their home or go work for another, another operation. My personal opinion is stock options, a formalized bonus structure is something that It'd be good to have in place down the road when you're making three, five, six million dollars a year and you've got somebody in that counting position, you've got some budget to kind of play with it, make sure it's working really well. In, in our kind of growth stages, until you're into that two, three, four, five million dollar mark, what I like to do is pay bonuses on an ad hoc basis. Um, maybe put it in your calendar every three weeks or twice a month or once once per month but paying small bonuses unexpectedly giving out some some gift certificates has a bigger impact uh, i believe on retention than putting together a formal structure that doesn't kind of move the needle um, definitely if you have those key key barbers who are bringing in tons of business getting referrals even even for the other barbers yeah, definitely get them extra money. You know, look at, oh, if he's brought in over, you know, 8,000 in business this month, only cost me 2,000. Yeah, I'm going to give him a $500 bonus. Really pay attention to those key employees and make sure they're getting compensated well. But a formal stock option plan, I wouldn't, I would look at until you're into that multi-million dollar range uh, because it will affect you need to look at things your ability to resell the business if there's um, people who have options in it and and that formal bonus structure you know how how much can it do to keep employees um, i've got a client they've got i think bonuses in about the 30 30,000 range every quarter uh, high value they're in in mining high value employees and people are leaving because they can start their own businesses and make 30,000 in a month. So uh, it, people are gonna turn over, just be aware of that. Um, and I, I think the informal, definitely put it in your, your calendar to make sure it's happening, uh, but just surprising people with those bonuses makes a bigger difference. You know, rolling in with a couple hundred dollars cash on a Thursday or a Friday, uh, that, employee gets to take that home, that can have a much bigger impact than a, a check where, you know, all the taxes are taken off. Sure, you have to take the taxes off and you let your bookkeeper know um, and it will affect them. But if you can actually give somebody cash or write them a check for $500, that makes a bigger difference. They can take that home. Their wife's like, oh, you know, when they're thinking about starting their own business, like, oh, you won't get any of those, you know, those bonuses. You know, that one you got last Christmas was great, you know. So I, I personally don't think there's a need to have a real formal bonus structure and stock options early on in a business until you get to that, you know, higher level where you're working closely with an accountant and a bookkeeper who can manage that structure for you. All right. Thanks so much. Next question is from Greg. Uh, Greg is in the business uh, B2B space. So businesses are a client and he's contemplating purchasing a lead list. What's the best way to find a company that can provide me with a list that is right for my business? So I'm not super familiar with, you know, specific tailored the lead lists. I get spammed all the time with these offshore lead lists that they think are going to be helpful to me. I 
I personally like LinkedIn Sales Navigator. It's a tool that you can use to look at businesses that you know you might have done business with before and find similar ones as well. Um, so LinkedIn Sales Navigator, I think it's about 50 bucks a month. It doesn't get you all the contact information, but it allows you to contact more people on LinkedIn. And you can tie that in with things like Signal Hire, uh, which then can get you contact information so you can then make some cold calls as well, right? So you might warm them up with a, a LinkedIn uh, message, but then you can also follow up with a, a phone, uh, phone or an email as well, right? So um, LinkedIn Sales Navigator and Signal Hire, a couple tools that you can get for um, think under 100 bucks for both of them, uh, but definitely under 200 bucks for both of them. Uh, and Signal Hire has a free one. So yeah, at least get five leads a month as well, which you, you can try. So you can try it out. Uh, but definitely if, if, if you can see some good uh, lead lists that you, you think are thorough, one of the things I pay for is Zoom Info. Um, we pay, I think through through some partnerships, I, I think we pay about three to 5,000 uh, per per license. If you try as a one-off to go and, and buy a Zoom Info account, I think they try and charge you like 15,000, but it gives you cell phone numbers, right? So think about how many emails you get, how many voicemails you don't answer. Um, really what you respond to often is text messages. So I would look at, you know, if you really wanna make that investment, see if you can find a partnership with somebody who sells uh, Zoom Info or if that lead list is coming to you, make sure it's got cell phone numbers. I think that makes such a big difference in reaching out to decision makers and actually getting responses. On sales scripts, um, definitely I would look at working with past clients, finding out what worked for them as far as your approach and improving on that. Uh, definitely lots of good books out there. Jeff Gittimer, uh, Tom Black, he's, he's got a book. Um, Sales scripts do work for some people. Uh, they don't work for me. Uh, good questions work for me, right? So, you know, what what's happening in your business right now? Um, what are your struggles around your, your website? Um, do you feel like you're getting enough leads and conversions on your website? Um, you know, those sort of things might be related to your, your business, but just asking really good questions that say, oh, this person's thinking about things other than just getting the sale. The, the sale, right? So what is happening for your business that I might be able to help you out with in the future? Um, but de definitely, uh, if you can work with a sales trainer, you've got a budget, definitely some good sales trainers out there, you know, follow them. And, and, and really, when you've got that budget, go get some intensive, um, intensive sales training. Next question is from uh, Josh, my brother's name, Josh, great name. How do I ask questions? Uh, how do I know what questions to ask mentor when I don't know what questions to ask? Now, Josh is transitioning from a full-time employee to, to running his own business. So one of the things I always like to ask, if especially if I'm sitting down face-to-face -face with a mentor, is what's new? What's new in your business? What's new in your life, right? Because those are, those are things that might kind of excite them, uh, might get them thinking about something that they didn't actually fully go into, but might be an opportunity. So what's new? Um, also, you know, what made the biggest difference in your sales? What made the biggest difference in your personal life running the business? What made the biggest difference? What made the biggest improvements? And what else? Those are, are two questions that really hopefully get them thinking about, you know, what, what got them the most sales? What really changed their, their business from, you know, being a, like yours, you know, currently just an idea to growing it to where there's enough revenue so they can quit their job, growing it to enough revenue so they can build a team, scaling it beyond that as well, right? So um, definitely what's new, what helped change your business, and what mistakes did you make along the, the, the way when you were looking at hiring people? Um, everybody can say, oh yeah, I've hired good people, but We've all hired bad people as well, right? So asking about those mistakes and the things that they learned and improved upon really makes a difference. So definitely, you know, kind of be probing with those those members and or mentors and ask, you know, have, have four to five questions. Um, and then, you know, 
what are they doing around goal setting? So both personally and in, in, in the business, right? Because the top business people usually have some really good systems for their personal life. And that can really help you as you move into your, your business life uh, to have those personal attributes happening, right? So what habits are they working on? What books are they reading, right? Because, you know, if, if you're hanging out with an entrepreneur who, who's doing 100 million and you ask what books they're reading, read those books, right? Uh, what books made a difference for them 10 years ago as well, right? Because those books can still resonate. They can still make a difference. So another uh, question from Ricardo. How do you weigh the cost and returns uh, with many events and conferences you sh should attend within your industry to build relationships and get industry knowledge? I personally think industry specific, unless you're possibly gonna get some clients out of it, one to two uh, industry events or uh, conferences. Um, you know, definitely local ones. If you can get there, just be there in an evening and, and get home, you know, that's great. But if you're talking about travel, multiple days, making an investment in the thousands of dollars, one conference a year, I think, is enough. Um, and, and definitely going through the last couple of years with the pandemic has shown that a lot of really good businesses have grown without attending conferences, too many conferences. Um, if there's one you like in a great location and, you know, kind of fits with your budget, and you, you know, you take take your wife there. Sure, go to go to a second one. Uh, but really, you know, two to three a year industry specific is, is not something I recommend. Uh, definitely at least one industry specific and then do a second one, which is more general business specific. Do one that's personal, right? Uh, so probably one per quarter, uh, but in all areas, right? So one that's at personal development, right? So go to a Tony Robbins seminar if you can, or something similar, that motivational, see how they do sales, like that, that's a great experience. Uh, but switch it up, right? Um, you know, if, if you're, you're somebody who really needs to be centered, go on a yoga retreat, go on a conference that relates to that, right? And it'll help you kind of be a really well-rounded entrepreneur. Um, and, and definitely, yeah, take advantage of those local ones. Uh, but definitely, personally, I'm like once a month, right, on, on local events that take, take me away from my family. I got two young kids. I, I've got lots of room to grow the business. So um, it, it depends also where you are in your career, right? Uh, but definitely, I, I think quarterly, so kind of in those 90-day stretches, am I doing something to improve myself? And then annually, am I getting that to that annual conference? Um, and then if I'm going to fit a couple more in, what else could I do instead that could help me really um, catapult myself as a person and a, as an entrepreneur? Great question. Next uh, question is from Michael. Mike asks, when a client wants to break the contract with you because you don't offer something they are now asking for and was not in the contract, how do you deal with it? Now, that's, that's a tough one. Our, our contracts are really simple for our clients to break. We just break them. Um, you know, there, there's a financial implication, uh, but usually they've either paid it up front or there's no financial implication. So I'm personally of the view that you should let customers go if they don't want to do business with you. Uh, but if you really want that customer, go and meet with them. You know, negotiating with somebody who's already got to a point where they want to break a contract with you by email, it's not going to work. Uh, you know, it looks like in your case, they've already involved a lawyer. It's probably, ir you know, irreparable at this point. Uh, but the best way to repair it is say, listen, I'd love to meet with you. Can I come and meet with you in the office, right? Um, and eliminating multiple parties, you know, make sure that you, you if, if this is a really important contract, big, bring your business partner or bring the account manager as well. Get there, sit down, and see if you can hash out and continue to work together. Um, you know, there might be a three-year obligation, but what does a bad Google review do do to you, right? Um, you know, like I've I've got clients where we delivered services, and then something didn't quite work out, and then we were required to do warranty work, but they hadn't paid us yet. So, should I have sued them to get the the money so then we can do warranty work, it was just messy. So I said, you know what, I'm gonna write that off. 
as a learning experience, improve my contracts going forward and our sales process and never deal with that industry again. I hope there's no um, concrete finishing road building pavement uh, companies who are part of accelerators. Nothing against them. Great people. I just don't do business to business contracts with them. Right. Um, I've had bad experiences, but what, what you need to look at is what is it worth in, in fighting this? What is it going to cost in energy and lawyers fees? I would only go to court for like a hundred thousand. That's the only amount of money I would go to court for because of the amount of energy it would take and how many other good customers I could get with that energy. So, uh, definitely in-person negotiation is way better than email or phone. Um, next best thing is a video conference. And then failing that is phone conference. And then if you're on that email lawyer to lawyer basis, I personally would walk away, go find a better client. Um, but you know, I don't know the size of your, your contracts. Uh, so definitely worthwhile bouncing this off to some other mentors who understand your business a little bit better than I do. I don't know what business you're in, um, with the email I've got, it's a generic, uh, Gmail. So, uh, next question comes from Kelly. What steps would I need to take if I wanted to try and find and hire a commission-based salesperson since I don't have a budget to pay a salary, but I know there's business out there. So I'm not a big fan of commission-based salespeople. It's, um, and salary-based salespeople. Uh, the issue I've got with them is, is that they might not fully round out your business. They might, sell something that you can't quite deliver. Uh, but it, I definitely understand you need help in growing the business. Um, so one thing that I would suggest to start is, could you get some administrative help part time that would either free you up to do sales or get them to help with the sales process? So can you hire an administrative help that could send a thank you card to all your past clients? Could you find somebody to, to do a, a mail out, you know, uh, showing no new equipment that you purchased? Can they set up a CRM, a customer relationship management system with for you? So you can, you know, send out a, on a, on a Tuesday, say, Hey, we're having a Friday special. Cause you can see in your, your calendar, you've got space to do work on Thursday and Friday. Um, you know, we, we've got a, you know, a one, one time special this next Friday to, uh, in this case, you're in the excavation business and road construction. Um, say, you know, we, we've got got space to do excavation on Thursday, Friday, right? And uh, we're, we're given 10% off. You know, you might have raised your rates uh, to make up for that 10%, but at least you're getting that business in the door. You're alerting them. Um, the other thing is, is touching base with old clients. Uh, I've got a client that they're not going to do uh, another round of business with us right now. But I'm going to drop by there, drop off a little present. Uh, he's a he's a big fisherman and hunter, so I'm, I'm getting him a, a diamond sharpening stone. It's just something that I know he'll use, and I'm just going to drop it off for him. In the construction industry, I know a lot of people they they bring by donuts at, at the end of the day, and that's some something that or at the start of the day, kind of on a sales call. That's something an administrator could do as well. You know, I I don't want to be sexist here, but a lot of administrators um, can be very good looking. And if they dropped in at your, your client and just say, Hey, you know, these are, these are from Kelly. Uh, you know, here, here's a, a box of donuts. It can, you know, kind of change things around for you. Right. And it's like, Oh yeah, Kelly from excavating, you know, with some business cards. So yeah, personally commission salespeople, I'm not sure is the best, best route. Uh, but investing in things that are repeatable, uh, an administrative person who can take things off, touch base with old clients, like call all of your clients that you had uh, in the last year and just say, Hey, do you have any construction projects coming up that require uh, excavation? You know, we're, we're trying to fill up the last part, uh, spots in, in our calendar th th this, this coming month, you might have a full, full spot that's open, but you know, say, Oh, we're trying to, you know, make sure that we've got space for you since you're a valued client. And that's a super easy script rather than somebody, um, you know, trying to understand uh, your, your construction clients' businesses, right? So just, hey, uh, just calling on behalf of Kelly, 
We just wanted to check what you've got coming down the pipe for the next quarter or the next month. Um, will you need any excavating? Because we've got a few spots left in our calendar. So that scarcity um, uh, scarcity mentality is something good that an administrator can do. Uh, and they might turn into a top salesperson for you. Um, hopefully, you can get them some somewhat affordably in, in your, your area. Uh, but the nice thing is, what I, I like to say is if you, if you can go after that flexible person, uh, so somebody who might be a single parent, uh, has to drop kids off at school and, and kind of can give you three to four hours in the middle of their day, that might be ideal for them and ideal for you. Uh, they can work from home. You can give them a cell phone, um, you know, spend a couple hours training them. Uh, but lots of people with great administrative backgrounds can work from home, move the needle for you, uh, and send out those thank you cards. Really kind of touch base with customers that you haven't, um, you know, as, as we move into September, get things set up for uh, December to be able to send a small gift to all, all your past clients, right? Uh, having those things in place, uh, but also having them work the phone or, you know, send out some mail outs all on a fairly, fairly low budget, but you know, you can maybe do that on a few hundred dollars a week. Um, and hopefully they can start answering the phone for you during those hours. You can just forward your cell phone. You can get more done for your customers uh, and get some time back as well. So you can engage in some of that sales work as well. So your administrator can say, hey, can you follow up with Mike at uh, um, Joe's, Joe's Contracting? Uh, he says he's got a, f a five, um, five unit complex that he, he's, he's going to need. Perfect, right? Uh, she can take things off your plate and can give you those leads for you to close, right? Because a salesperson who doesn't know, you know, um, the different types of excavators that are needed, if you need to rent other equipment, might not be able to close anyways, where uh, a sales administrator or an administrator can really kind of set you up. Then you can go in, assess the situation, get the sale done correctly, um, and, and really move on from there. I hope that's helpful. I hope you're all, you know, thinking about how you can grow your sales this month. I'm, I'm really, you know, bullish. You know, it looks, it looks like gas prices have come down a little bit over this summer. Uh, the economy seems to be going pretty strong. So hoping you're getting a chance to grow your sales, get those sales material out there and um, yeah, just, just kill it. Thanks. I'll see you on the next one.